Hi, folks. Thanks so much for being here with us tonight. Welcome to the new Red Emmas. Um, we're obviously thrilled that you're here. It's nice to see this space filled with so many amazing people, so many familiar faces, so many um, new faces, so many people that we hope we're going to see here on a regular basis. Um, my name is Kate Katib. I'm one of the founding worker owners here at Red Emma's. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the event tonight and to just take a minute here at the beginning to tell you a little bit about, um, about Red Emma's, about what we're doing here and, and what we hope is on the horizon. Um, so as most of you know, I'm sure, um, Red Emma's is a worker-owned cooperative. That means that everyone you see working here either is a partial owner of this business or is on a pathway towards ownership. That's incredibly, incredibly important for us and it's also incredibly rare especially in the service industry, especially in an industry that is largely defined by jobs with precarity, jobs without stability, jobs without dignity. Um, many of us, not all of us, but many of us came to working at Red Emma's from other jobs in the service industry, working as cooks, working as servers, working as baristas, working in retail, um, and finding that as um, people who um, don't necessarily conform to the status quo as people of color, as black and brown folks, as women, queer, and trans folks, um, as people with very different political perspectives on what happens in the world, we were often not treated very well. We were often not treated with dignity or respect. We learned that our opinions didn't matter um, and that we were not given, we didn't have the right to control what happened in our everyday work lives. So when we started Red Emma's, we wanted to change that. We wanted to think about building a place where we could come together, um, where we could provide a space that was safe um, for us, a space that was safe for people in our communities, both close and extended, and a place where we could experiment with different, different forms of democracy in the workplace, different forms of shared ownership and shared decision making. And we started that project in 2003. We opened our first space in 2004 in a tiny basement storefront not far from here. Um, we grew. We started other cooperative projects in different parts of the city and then we expanded into the location that many of you have probably been to which was on the corner of um, North and Maryland in Station North and that was our home for five years and that was an incredible experience. It was a challenging experience trying to grow a teeny tiny little basement storefront into a big thriving restaurant and bookstore that was packed on a regular basis was no easy feat um, and somehow through the kind of amazing collaboration of all the people who came together to own and build and sustain that space we managed to do it for five years and then this place opened up and kind of came on our horizon and we said well I mean, it's kind of big, it's kind of crazy. Do we really think we have the capacity to expand our, you know, kind of small in comparison bookstore and restaurant and cafe into something this big? And, you know, Red Emma's likes challenges. So we said, sure, yeah, we're gonna do that. And so here we are, we found ourselves here back in Mount Vernon, uh, which is a very, very different environment that we're still trying to wrap our heads around. Um, and in this big, beautiful new space that gives us the ability to do so many different things, um, to have a full service bar, to have a full service restaurant, to give the bookstore space to really grow and, and establish an identity um, that is distinct from the restaurant, um, but still maintain that flow between books and events and food and drink and community. Um, we hope that this place will continue to be a site for community. You know, when we looked into the history of this building, there have been a lot of things in here. Folks have probably seen a lot of restaurants come and go in this place, but the thing that was a reference point for us um, was a jazz and blues club that was here mm -hmm. in um, the 1980s. And it was run by Ethel Ennis. Ethel Ennis is a Baltimore um, blues legend, uh, and she, along with her husband Earl, ran this space as a, as a club, um, as a blues club, as a place to bring people in that blues community together on a regular basis. 
And for us, that was a huge reference point. That was the thing that we were thinking about um, when we were trying to figure out how do we define this space and how do we make it our own? How do we grow a community inside of this building? Um, the, le the legacy of Ethel's place is constantly on our minds and is something that we're constantly thinking about and looking towards. We also discovered just recently that uh, the Baltimore Communist Party used to have their meetings upstairs. So we were like, okay, great, this is a good fit. Ethel's place in the Baltimore Communist Party sounds like Red Emma's. So here we are, we find ourselves here today and we can't thank you enough for being here to celebrate with us, to um, experience our grand opening, to see what we're up to. I invite you at any point to grab any of the workers here any of the worker owners here um, and ask them questions, give them ideas, give them suggestions. We're looking for ways to use this space to be um, the community, the community hub that we all need and want, especially in these increasingly challenging times. Um, so before I introduce our speaker for tonight, could we maybe just have a round of applause for all of the workers who are busting their asses tonight? <laughs> Um, I think it's fitting that our grand, um, our grand opening speaker is the incomparable Sylvia Federici. <laughs> I could probably just stop there, but I'm going to say just like one more thing. Um, Sylvia's, Sylvia, uh, I think, has the distinct honor of now having spoken in, in every single one yeah. of our spaces, our, our very first basement storefront, our, our big location on North yeah. Avenue, once at a book festival, mm. I yeah. think, and now here at our, at our grand opening event. Um, Sylvia's work has been a really important reference point for us within the context of Red Emma's, especially as we think about the way that the work that we do here intersects with economies of care, um, the way that the work that we do here is about um, recognizing, celebrating, supporting the unseen labor um, that so often propels, um, propels us forward as a society. Um, I don't need to tell you that, that Sylvia is one of, at least in my opinion, one of the, the foremost feminist um, Marxist scholars of of um, certainly her generation, but I think also of mine. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's, incredibly, um, it's incredibly important to see Sylvia's ability to go back to the work, um, the seminal work that she did in, um, that she did as an activist, um, that she did with Caliban and the Witch, which is of course one of the books that a lot of you are or thinking about as a reference point, and to think about how to go back, how to recapture that theory, how to, how to reapply it to where we are today, to think about the continuing, never-ending struggle um, and the, the push that we have to make to continue to move forward. Um, so I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Please join me in welcoming Sylvia Federici. <laughs> I think I'm probably more comfortable standing than on this thing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, thank you, Kay, for your good words. And thank you to Red Emma for inviting me here once again. And I want to say, my God, I'm so happy to see this place. And uh, I'm so uh, really feeling strengthened and joyous at uh, realizing that for 15 years now, Red Emma has been able to be on the scene, bringing people together. And with, I know how much struggle that has been, particularly in this time, when it's become so difficult to get a social space, so difficult to get a place where people can come together and, you know, like a real common of knowledge this has been. So I really think, uh, that um, we should celebrate this evening, you know, as the grand opening of this new space. And uh, we are looking forward to many, many, many years of, uh, you know, this great contribution you're making to Baltimore and to the movement in general. Now, I'm happy to contribute to it tonight. 
and uh, I'm here to launch two books and they are sitting here. One is Witches, Witch Hunting and Women and the other is Winchanting the World. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about these two books, um, you know, what, what's the theme, what they are trying to, to express. And, uh, and I want to leave enough time to, for the question period because uh, I don't just want to speak to you, but I really want to hear what's happening, what kind of struggle you're doing, because particularly in this moment, I think that coming together and uh, connecting the struggles that uh, you know, different groups, different people are making is one of the most important tasks that we all are facing. Uh, in these two books, I continue some themes. I continue to work on some themes that have been really essential to my, to my intellectual work and political activism for many, many years now. Uh, witch hunting, witches and women, it's really focused on uh, the relationship between the development, capitalist development, the development of new forms of work, new forms of accumulation, and uh, the, the rise, the surge of violence, and in particular, the surge of violence against women. And uh, so, in a way, uh, witch hunting and witches updates uh, some of the themes of the argument in Caliban and the Witch, now bringing them to the present bringing them to the present, and I'm going to speak more to it in a minute. Uh, the enchanting the world is also connected with uh, the rise the, of new forms of accumulation, with, uh, in particular with what we call globalization and uh, the return of forms of economic activity and uh, economic initiatives that recall you know, the period of primitive accumulation, recall the earliest phase of capitalist development, the earliest and most violent forms of capitalist accumulation. But the, the main theme of enchanting the world is also the struggle that women in particular, communities and women in particular are making in different parts of the world, uh, not only to resist, uh, dispossession, displacement, but also in the process to create new community, to create new social relations. So there is a connection between the, the two, the two books. There is an important connection. Both are concerned with uh, capitalist violence in all its forms, but at the same time, both are focused on looking at uh, you know, what we can do about it, what people are doing about it, and uh, not only, again, in terms of defending what we have or, don't, or resisting uh, the policies and attacks that are coming, but also in terms of creating, starting in the present, starting in the present, creating something new, seeding, planting the seeds for the new society. This, this is the, the thematics. Now, uh, in uh, Witch Hunting and Witches, I look in particular, I mean, it's uh, quite schematically, the book is divided in two parts to give you an idea of what you will find there. Uh, but the book is divided in two parts. In part one, I take a, a quick look back to the past again to the 16th, 17th century, you know, trying to go a little deeper, you know, in some of the themes of Caliban and the Witch, and in particular, uh, trying to look more deeply into the relation between witch hunting in the first phase of capitalist development and uh, the attack on communitarian relation, the attack on the commons, land privatization and the dispossession of the peasantry from the land. And uh, so I'm looking at the relationship between witch hunting 
and the process that uh, in some uh, the Marxist tradition has gone under the name of the enclosure. Right? The enclosure when they used to, the landlord used to put fences around the common lands so that uh, the peasantry would not be able to go back to the land that they used to cultivate in common. So I, I try to look more deeply into that. This is really part of a work that for me has become ongoing. And I keep hoping also in this process of inspiring people to do this work. Because I think there is a lot that we can learn by looking back you know, to the historical past. And particularly looking back at this early phase of capitalist development. And particularly at this phenomenon of witch hunting that uh, has been so understudied and so under-understood. And, uh, and I'm beginning to understand more and more and more how important it has been you know, to the process, to the attack on community, to the attack on communalism, uh, the attack on uh, the regime of common land property, because it is a kind of accusation that really sows suspicion you know, among community in communities that are supposed to be united and fight against, uh, against, for example, land privatization. And at the very moment when this community had to be most united in the face of a developing capitalist economy, you know, you have uh, an intervention from above, basically, you know, spreading accusation you know, accusing some of the members of the community of being servants of the devil, of being, in fact, engaged in activities that are destroying the community itself. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of accusation that uh, really needs to be studied because it's very powerful in terms of creating suspicions. It's also difficult to prove, right? Because uh, the witches were supposed to act in ways in the night and uh, you know, protected by the obscurity and in ways that uh, you know, normally could not be detected. So it's a kind of, of charge that is perfect to sow uh, discord, suspicion, and division. And I think uh, it's not an accident that today, in a very different context, but in a moment, in a time, in which, again, you know, we witness a massive expansion of capitalist relations across the world, and the most brutal expansion, you know, with very similar phenomena, land privatization, massive displacement of people, uh, dispossession from the land or from the jobs or from the services, from the means of reproduction, on which people relied for their survival, massive dispossession of that. And this is a global phenomenon. We also see a return of witch hunting in many, many different ways. Uh, in some literal ways, for example, across Africa, India, and other uh, regions of the so-called third world, we actually have persecutions again of women you know, in the name of their practicing witchcraft. Right? In other words, we again have seen in the last two, three decades, hand in hand with the proceeding of the globalization process, we have seen an increase, a return of accusation of witchcraft and women being arrested, being tortured, being burned, uh, very much as in the 16th and 17th century. I don't know. If you are aware that, for example, in some country like at the north of Ghana, there are now several concentration camps for women who are reputed to be witches, who have been expelled from their communities, and uh, are basically living in very, very wretched conditions. And, uh, you know, they, there's been a, practically a lot of indifference to this phenomenon. But when you go and look into it, you really begin to see that this return of witch hunting has nothing to do with uh, you know, the superstition of certain culture, the certain culture are more superstitious than others, really has to do with the fact that uh, 
you know, witch hunting is very useful. Once again, it's very useful to the politics of dispossession. It's very useful to the politics of displacement. It's very useful to divide community. At the moment in which uh, many communities are under tremendous stress, because, for example, throughout Africa, uh, we see you know, the consequences of policies like those of the World Bank, of the IMF, structural adjustment, land privatization, that are, again, you know, a massive, massive attack against people. And so in uh, witch hunting, witches and women, this is what I look upon. I look at uh, what's behind, uh, what are the factors that are now motivating, that are now motivating in several parts of the world you know, this new phenomenon, the return of a phenomenon that one would have hoped to have ended in the 18th century. And, uh, and yet, it's coming back with the, with the new strength. And at the same time, I'm also looking, still in this book, I'm also looking at the more generalized violence that has been surging across the globe particularly against women, but also against trans people. And of course, I, as I always, always rush to say, it's not affecting women in any uniform way, because those who are really most uh, attacked are women who have been racialized, are women who have no economic resources, proletarian women of all types, uh, women of color, migrant. Right? But at the same time, there is a general rise of violence against women that can be connected very much, again, to new forms of work, new economic policies, and so forth. And uh, quite quickly, uh, what I try to do in this book, in one uh, section of it, I try to present a sort of a map, you know, a map that looks at the different factors that are, are motivating the surge of violence. And uh, again, definitely a key one. Uh, for example, a factor at the origin of many forms of femicide or feminicide across Latin America and parts of Africa you know, is precisely the new, are precisely the new forms of development that are now more and more centered on extractivist politics. By extractivist politics, I mean, you know, mining, you know, oil drilling, right, and the construction of mega projects like hydroelectric plant, big highways, so that the wealth of this country and the labor, what the labor of this country produces can be exported, you know, throughout the world. And all of this require, again, massive displacement of people. And there is a now a growing literature, particularly in Latin America, that shows that uh, it is uh, precisely, you know, the, the violence against women is the a structural requirement for this type of economic policies. Because violence against women, uh, and not only we have more violence, but we also have new forms of violence. Uh, for instance, we have forms of violence that want to be public. They do not try to hide themselves, that want to be more visible. So then not only people and women in particular are killed, but their bodies are left in public places so that everybody will see them. And their bodies will also be carry signs of torture so as to send a message of terror. This is now being grown in many, many places. And there's, as I said before, a literature on this uh, issue uh, showing that A, uh, this attack on women and this publicizing of the violence, you know, it's certainly a way to uh, send a message 
to the communities affected that uh, their resistance to this possession is useless because they face people uh, that know no limits. And at the same time, it's also because in so many cases, it is women who are in the front line in the resistance against these policies. And there is, a, again, a very interesting literature that I refer to of uh, many women's organizations who now recognize that the struggle, women are protagonists of the struggle against mining, against oil company, because they are the ones who are most directly involved in the reproduction of their communities and most keenly aware that when the, the waters, the, the earth, the soil are contaminated by oil drilling or mining, for example, gold mining, right, uses a lot of mercury and other chemicals, uh, is the end of the community. So that many times these women are the ones who are first targeted, both by the goons of the companies. Now companies have their own private armies. Many, many companies uh, you know, have their own uh, Sometimes they even have their own jails. Sometimes they even have places where they arrest and torture people when they are resisting this possession. But at times they also meet the resistance and the violence of men in their own community, particularly younger men who often have been unemployed for many years. And they are easily seduced by the money, the salaries that the companies are offering because it's a bit of a power. And they don't see down the line to see that uh, once again, as I was saying before, uh, that uh, the soil, the water, the air has been contaminated, uh, the community itself is bound to die. No? So these are some, of the, are some of the factors that I begin to look at that are really at the center of the organizing, for example, of movements like the movement in Argentina, the New Namenos, or the movement in Honduras, because so many of the women and also campesino leaders, leaders of the movement, feminist leaders of movements like Berta Cáceres, have been killed because of this resistance been killed because of the struggles that they have made, right? So, <clears throat> in conjunction with this uh, work, with this book and this analysis, which is an analysis that draws very heavily on the work that particularly women in Latin America have made. And here I want to cite especially the name of Rita Segato. I don't know if some of you know her work already. She is a Brazilian feminist sociologist. And she has done a special, um, a lot of work in looking at these new forms of public violence. She speaks of a pedagogy of cruelty, of a pedagogy of cruelty, looking at the new forms of feminicide in Latin America, you know, referring to you know, what I mentioned before, you know, the fact that the, the killings want to publicize themselves, they want to be visible, they want to send a message, so they, they have a pedagogical intent. And, and she argues, for instance, that the forms of violence we see now are not um, dictated by passion or hatred, but they are handbook forms of violence, are the kind of violence that you find in the counterinsurgency. And now, what is applied to women, it's the kind of violence that was taught, for instance, by you know, the American army in uh, the process of training people in Latin America, Central America, for counterinsurgency uh, initiatives. So, uh, I think that uh, this kind of understanding is very important because uh, it really gives us a much broader view 
of what capitalist development needs. You know, uh, the capitalist development really, for most people, is a form of violence. Capitalist development is a form of violence. And uh, that the violence that women or other people meet is not just the product of uh, you know, perverse individual, but it's a structural economic factor. It's a structural factor because you cannot have the new forms of capitalism, the new form of economic development, without a tremendous amount of violence. And so, to sum it up, one point of the book is also to in incite a reflection on what is capitalism today on the fact that 500 years after the beginning of a capitalist society, we still are in a situation in which uh, we have a capitalist international class that tells us that uh, they still don't have resources for most of the world population, that they still have to take away our lands, they still have to take, destroy the resources, the means of reproduction that we have, and they still have to employ massive form of violence, continuous warfare, right? And so this analysis, it's really, you know, finalized to reflect again, you know, on, you know, what is this capitalist system and how whatever kind of struggle we engage in, we really need to look beyond the, the, this, this system now and at the same time, uh, it's, it's an analysis that rejects the position of the victim, right? I always repeat what women in Colombia once told us at the Forum on Feminicide. You know, we refuse to take the position of the victim and we refuse you know, to just count our bodies to just count the bodies of those of us who have been killed, right? We talk about the violence because we want to talk about the struggle against it. We want to talk about what we're going to do about it. And so this is also part of my analysis. What is the women are doing? What are the most forms of resistance in, in situation, right, in which uh, continuously for the struggle that you engage in, your life, is on the line, you know, how do you protect yourself? How do you resist the end? And this is extremely important. And uh, one thing that has come out from so many conversations, also with people in the United States, is that uh, in response to all kinds of violence, uh, the response to this violence should not be to turn for protection to the state should not be in for two terms for protection. Because in the end, it's the state that legitimizes either with impunity or by uh, incentivizing certain type of politics is in fact responsible. So to think that we can redress, you know, the violence that is perpetrated against entire communities uh, by returning to the state, for example, demanding more severe penalties or demanding more, more, people, that more people be jailed, right? It's a very counterproductive and in the end results in new forms of victimization of the very community that have been victimized to begin with, right? And so I think that across the world there is now a revolt against uh, what now some call Certainly, Angela Davis did that. Carceral feminism, the kind of feminism that we saw, for example, at the beginning of the 70s, that thought that the solution to violence against women to was to demand, put more people in jail, extend the penalties, and so forth, right? So the question now is, what kind of other forms of justice, what kind of other form of reconstruction of the community the importance of reconstruction. And I've been in many discussions with women, particularly in Latin America and Central America, 
very impressed by what women from communities that have witnessed massacres and have witnessed horrible massacres, for example, in Colombia, uh, what they said, which was that we refuse to even look at the people who come and kill us as our enemies. Because many of these youth who come and kill us, they are themselves victims. They have been hired. They have been, their life has been destroyed so much that they don't realize what they are doing when they go to war against their communities. Right? And it was a very difficult hear things to hear, but in the end there is a logic to it. Because many of the material ex executors of the violence are in fact themselves people from the very communities, you know, who have been uh, brutalized by so many different factors that uh, can be hired, you know, like the Pinkerton used to do, used to say, I hire half of the working class to kill the other half or to discipline the other half. Well, that is continuing today. Um, and the last about this book is that when we speak of violence, and this is one of the themes that uh, I also want to develop more in the work that I'm doing now. Uh, first and foremost, we have to recognize that all the violence is fundamentally and primarily institutional. That uh, the domestic violence that has been surging, the public violence of the paramilitary, of the narcotrafico, and so on, would not exist if we didn't have government, if we didn't have institutions, if we didn't have states that, in fact, not only respond with total impunity, you know, but also pass legislation, pass policy, legitimize forms of economic development that, in fact, require, demand, and implement their violence. So this is very important. And last, uh, uh, again, uh, first and foremost, to recognize that also much of what does not appear as violence is in reality violence. When, for example, as recently in Argentina, uh, the government overnight cuts the value of the local currency by 40%, so that immediately whoever has a monetary income has half. This is what is happening now to millions of people. Imagine, I don't know whatever your income, monetary income is, imagine that tomorrow morning you wake up and it's half of it. And the expenses are exactly the same. On the contrary, they might even have gone up. Because if you're buying something that is being imposed, the devaluation of the currency will imply that, in fact, that the cost will increase. So that's violence. That is violence. So we need to also change the conception and extension of what violence is. Because when people, when you have a policy that causes people to die, violence is, uh, does not have to be perpetrated only with a gun or with a machete. Every time that uh, the life of human beings is in the balance, it's violence. And I think it's important to recognize that. Now, in uh, re-enchanting the world, right, a much more promising title, <laughs> a much more promising I look not only as in part one, and I won't go into it because I want to leave time for discussion, I look again at uh, the new forms of capitalist development, new form of primitive accumulation, but really the bulk of the book is uh, built on the concept of how in response to policies of displacement, dispossession, to policies that, as in the history of capitalism, destroy people's means of reproduction, makes it impossible for millions and millions of people across the world to have access 
to means of, to reproduce their life, right? which means that they are made available for the most intense forms of exploitation. Right? That uh, in response to that, you know, what we see, what has been happening in so many places, has been right, the communities and women in particular within them have begun to reconstitute new forms, constitute new forms of reproduction, reproductive work, more collective, more cooperative, and, uh, and in the process, not only enabling you know, so many people that would be destined to extinction to survive, but also creating something new, really creating uh, new forms of social relation, new forms of solidarity, and by that also a new capacity for resistance, a new capacity for confrontation with the state, a new capacity for a kind of struggle. They begin to think of a process of reappropriation of the wealth that people have produced. So this is what I'm looking uh, at in the second part of the, of the book. And I want to say something here because particularly in the United States, when we speak of the commons, you know, we, we often have to be reminded uh, that uh, when we speak of commons and reconstituting particularly the land commons, right? We are speaking of land that has been colonized, has been expropriated by the Native American, from the Native American population. So it is very important to acknowledge that, uh, you know, commoning cannot be imagined or implemented in any way, in any part of the continent or the world, right? Without a process of struggle that uh, reconstitutes and reaffirms the power and the rights, you know, of those of the Native American people, uh, of the Native indigenous population. One of the, you know, differences between the North American and the South American continent is certainly the fact that throughout South America, for instance, you still have a tremendous amount of uh, common land. You still have indigenous population that continue to have and hold the land in common. That is now very much under attack. A lot of the violence that you see across the Latin American continent really has to do with the land question. And when we speak of land, we don't speak only of the soil, we speak of waters, we speak of forests, we speak of animals, we speak of uh, access to the seas and so on. But certainly, you know, despite 500 years, 500 years of dispossession, for example, in Mexico, I mean, the Zapatista recently recuperated a lot of land. The MST in Brazil also recuperated a lot of land, but uh, not only we have those examples, but you still have many, many communities in which uh, the land is still held in common, people still do collective work. And I think the presence of this reality has had an impact also on the struggle of many people who are not, you know, in uh, indigenous territories. You know? So there is a tremendous struggle in indigenous territory, you know, against the uh, International Monetary Fund or the World Bank that now has this big project, the two big projects of the World Bank across the world, all in the name of empowerment. Uh, one is land privatization and the assignment of in individual title, right? Individual title. And this is presented as a big uh, improvement. You now have your title. You now are a land owner. So the World Bank has been pushing governments in Africa, 
in Latin America, pushing government to break up communalism and to divide up the land in pieces and give individual title. Of course, people have to pay for it. There is a lot of taxation, right? That is a tremendously violent process. First of all, it's a violent process because when you go from communal land to individual title, you have to break it up. Who gets the good land? Who gets the smaller pieces? Who gets? Secondly, it's really the quickest road to dispossession. It's really a quick road to dispossession because now you have this little piece of land and you're supposed to cultivate it with products, with commodities like coffee or coca, and you don't control the pricing system. You don't control. You now don't know if what you're producing can be sold. Who decides the price of the coffee or whatever else you're growing on your little piece of land? So two, three years after, you sell it, right? And this is the whole point anyway of dividing up. And of course, separated, you don't have the power to resist. When you have your little piece of land in individual campesinos rather than a community. And second is the microcredit. Microcredit is a major disaster. Again, you know, pushed in the name of empowerment. Right? Microcredit is supposed to empower women. Microcredit is an enormous form of violence. You know, they give you a little piece of money, maybe a few hundred dollars, and they give it to a group, not to an individual person. They give it usually to a group of women where every woman is responsible for the payment. So if I don't pay, you are responsible, which means that the group that was supposed to be a solidarity group turns into a group of women who are policing each other we are now beginning to look at how the others are behaving because they are afraid that if the others are drinking a beer more or something like that, in fact, they will have to pay in their place. So already it has happened in many, many places that uh, you know, women who could not pay were brutalized by the same women in the same group you know, who now were responsible. And the banks and NGOs that are giving the microcredit, were giving the credit, are also extremely violent, right? They, for example, put marks on the houses of the women who cannot pay. Uh, they will put the, the, the pictures of the women who cannot pay on the door of the banks, right? And uh, so there is a tremendous amount of uh, violence that communities are facing, tremendous. But in the face of that, nevertheless, there's also been a tremendous process, in my view, of reconstruction. And that's what I call the process of enchanting the world. Because, uh, you know, if you go today, you know, in many parts of Latin America, particularly in areas where a lot of people have been dispossessed, you see a lot of impoverishment, you see a lot of misery, but you also see the growth of an incredible solidarity. So that in many so-called slum, favelas, visions, right? new forms of reproduction are taking place that uh, are overcoming the form of isolation that has been characteristic of reproductive work. Right? Uh, somebody has written that in the history of capitalism, capitalism historically brings workers together in the factory and separates them in the community. That the way capitalism has been able right, to counter the sociality, for example, of factory work was always to separate people in the community. And the United States has been a leader 
right? Leave it down, you leave your job in the factory, and then you drive what's far away, so you don't go to a union hall, and you drive to your little house, all separate from each other. So the reproductive work traditionally has been done in a very, very isolating way. Everybody with their little house, thinking of their... And of course, this is not being completely true in working class community, particularly in moments of strike, right? That isolation continuously was being broken. But the normality of everyday life was a life of isolation, a life of separation with my children, your children, etc. Well, in this community now, there's something new that has been happening. And it's something that has been grown now for decades. You know, beginning with uh, the aftermath of uh, the coup in Chile, the Pinochet coup, right? When women in a situation of great paralysis, fear, impoverishment, they began to go out into the street, bring the cooking pots into the street, cook together, shop together. They started also creating sewing groups. You know, they started sewing, embroidering. And what they embroidered were the tanks, were the way people were being tortured. And often this was a way to communicate abroad, letting people know abroad, what was been happening in the country. But at the same time, also, you know, beginning to have a kind of collective work that enabled to overcome the fear and the paralysis that certainly prevailed in the time after the coup. The same happened in Argentina, in 2000, when the economy, the monetary economy collapsed, that you had the Picatero movement, it was mostly a women's movement, they began to bring, again, the pots into the, the streets, cook collectively, make decisions collectively through public assembly, you no, know, to neighborhood assembly decision-making, and now this continues on a much broader scale. It continues on a much broader scale in a lot of places where basically you find community of thousands of people that uh, have been totally neoliberalized in the sense that there is nothing that the state gives them, nothing. Right? Everything that is there is because people make it themselves. Right? There is no services, there is no street making. So everything that you go and see, for example, Villa de Quirobis in, in Buenos Aires, or Villa 21 or 24, everything that you see, the houses that have been built, the streets, the, the connection with the, for the electricity, and the potable water, it's really been because people have built it. And in that process in particular now, you know, you have a lot of new forms, what I call of collective reproduction. You know, the popular kitchen, the olas comunes, you know, where women often with young people rotate in cooking for hundreds of people. So it's not the same people who cook every day, but you may have group of six, seven, ten, one day, and another group tomorrow, but they're cooking collectively. Or you have the urban garden, urban farming. You have also ways of being uh, taking care of uh, the whatever needs and services the community is needing, but uh, is lacking because the state is not providing them. I was, for example, recently in uh, Division 21, 24 in Buenos Aires. And uh, we had an assembly with a lot of women from the area. And they explained, many, many, many of them, they explained how they've organized themselves. 
how they, for example, have groups of women who go every day to take the kids to school because they used to be run over by trucks or cars, there's no cross line, and they, then they go and they take them back. They have groups of women who deal with the health of the community in terms of checking what is happening and providing firms of first assistance, you know, looking at traditional forms of knowledge, medical knowledge, herbs, creams, all kinds of things. Uh, they have women who deal with the trash because nobody picks up the trash and they had a dengue epidemic and people died. So now they have rounds of, um, they go from house to house to see that there are people who always have something to eat. Some are very poor and sometimes they go for a day without eating. They do political formation. They study what are the needs of the community, what is happening in the country. They have a musical group, etc. So what, what you see, these are people who have nothing, but they have a fantastic form of self-organization and uh, they have uh, created a whole network of solidarity. They have a knowledge of what is necessary in the community. Who is the community? You know, and what is needed in the community? Uh, women have been killed in the community by the police, as well as by their lovers, or sometimes their fathers. And they work with the families of the women who have been killed. They go to court with them. They organize support groups. Right? So very, very powerful. And what they are doing is not only enabling people to live. I say this because I saw something that uh, I think is very important, not only Latin America, but it's important here too. It's not enabling only people to survive who otherwise may not have the means to survive. But they're also creating a whole infrastructure of struggle. They're creating a whole reproductive infrastructure that is very important for the resistance of people and for creating a whole process of negotiation and struggle with the state. And, uh, you know, something that I've learned through some of these experiences has been that, and, and the people know it's obvious, yeah? And you can actually see it from the history of labor history in the United States. You cannot have a long-term struggle as the kind of struggle that you need in front of this capitalist system. You cannot have a long-term struggle unless you have a whole, a particular type of reproductive infrastructure. A struggle needs a process of reproduction. I think this was one of the mistakes of many male-dominated organizations. That they always separated the struggle from the reproduction. And I think one of the power today of many women's struggle and women network, women's organization of the way that they're growing across the world is precisely this, that they learn the struggling is not really possible, particularly when confronting the level of violence the people are confronting now. I mean, every day, I, there are stories of another woman's leader who has been killed. Not only Berta Cáceres, or Marielle Franco in Brazil, but now almost every day women in Colombia and other places. You cannot confront the level of violence without creating a particular type of social fabric where people know each other, where people have effective relationship with each other, where they have a knowledge of the territory. They have a, a type of relationship with the territory and with each other that enable them to really resist for the long term. And on this, on this note, I also want to move towards a conclusion <clears throat> I also want to uh, speak about the role that uh, the reconstruction of collective memory, you know, has in this process. And this is again something that people are beginning to 
recognize, reflect upon, and work upon, which is uh, the simple realization that, uh, you know, it's where in the communities, in the territories, where people have the most uh, clear, acute uh, sense of what the history of the community has been, the history of the territory, where there still is a collective memory, where people know, you know who was buried here, where the struggle was made, you know, whose, whose blood was spilled in this land. You know, in those areas, the capacity for resistance, you know, it's higher. And uh, because that memory creates a common sense, creates a, a sense of a collective interest, creates a collective subject, right? The kind of memory or the kind of collective subject, that, for example, is created by certain songs, you know, when we sing the labor songs and so on, because there's something that uh, we feel, right? It's a common belonging. And uh, so the issue of memory, it's, uh, it's part of the construction of the commons. It's part of the construction of the commons. And uh, I think that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lesson, of course, that is not limited to, to Latin America, but it's a lesson that, uh, you know, uh, it's really as a global civic figure. And well, my, my work, I see my political work as giving my modest contribution to the deconstruction of this memory. And uh, I hope that these books will be that contribution too. Thank you so much. <clears throat> So before we move to question and answer, first of all, thank you, Sylvia, for that amazing, amazing talk. Um, before we move to question and answer, um, some of you may know there is a union organizing um, drive right now at Johns Hopkins University Hospital um, amongst the community of nurses. And uh, we have some of the folks who are pushing that, that struggle forward here tonight. They're going to come up really quickly and just tell you a little bit about the organizing work that they're doing. Hey, uh, my name is Ellie. I'm a nurse over at Hopkins Hospital. Hi, I'm Gianna, an NME organizer. Yeah, so we are working on forming a union, hopefully with NNU over at Hopkins. And, um, the nurses there, we are organizing to advocate for patient care and patient safety, um, first and foremost. We've come out recently with a patient care report that details some of our priority concerns related to patient care and patient safety. Um, this was presented recently at a, a town hall a couple weeks back. Um, if anyone is interested in the findings in that report, we can share those uh, more widely. Um, we're also organizing for improved working conditions within the hospital. Uh, but beyond that, beyond you know patient safety and working conditions, what we're also uh, hoping to stand against is some of the institutional violence that Hopkins Hospital has perpetrated against the community and continues to do so. Um, so this is really about keeping Hopkins accountable to the community in East Baltimore. Um, and we need the support from you guys. We need the community to make this happen. So if anybody is interested in ways to help out, we're going to pass around the sign-up sheet, um, and we're grateful for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've got about half an hour for questions. Um, it's going to be very difficult to hear in here. Um, so we're going to try having folks who have questions stand up and speak up. But if that doesn't work, then we're going to have you come up um, to the microphone to ask your questions. There's going to be a lot of questions. We're going to try to try and hear a lot of voices. So let's try and keep the questions <coughs> short if possible. So I see you back there in the blue. Yeah, I got to go soon. Uh, 
should we turn to the state um, for any help or guidance? And I was wondering, that, um, that bit of information that you spoke there, how does that pertain to the uh, sex worker liberation movement? Um, when I think of um, just, just the idea of like decriminalizing sex work, mm -hmm. so sex work is seen as actual labor and ways in which um, individuals provide in their community. And we can't turn to the state and tell them, hey, look, our labor is, 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 is valid and we should not be being raped by the police. Mm -hmm. How then should we, um, how then, I guess, if we, can't, if we can't ask the state to decriminalize the work and keep us safe from all of the violence from the state, how then should we organize around issues of protecting sex workers uh, to do the work that they do and to also contribute uh, to the community in ways that they can contribute to the community for decades? Yeah, I, I think there was some misunderstanding, so let me clarify because maybe I was not clear enough. I think there are two, two things that maybe you're thinking of, and I'm not sure which one. The first thing I said that it would be a mistake to turn to the state for the changing, you know, for, the, for example, demanding more severe penalties for those who perpetrate you know, violence and so on, right? which will seem the logical conclusion. Right? You, have, uh, you should ask him what, because the experience has been, and actually it's been mostly women, black women in the United States, <clears throat> organization like Insight and so on, who were among the first to say, look, asking for more severe penalties, you know, from the state, or more involvement of the police, you know, to protect us, is actually wrong. <laughs> because what it turns out to be is that they actually victimize us, you know, as it happens almost every day. You call the police, you are in the black community, call the police to, because to redress some violence, and they kill you, right? But on a brother. So, these have nothing to do with telling the state that they should decriminalize prostitution. This is a very different thing. It's simply not fighting to demand more severe penalties to actually, yeah. And or the other thing that I mentioned was, you know, that uh, you know, women working from below to reconstruct new forms of reproduction. That doesn't think, you know, it's not the neoliberal idea, oh well, you know, you just do it by yourself. I'm saying that that kind of solidarity building, reconstitution of the social fabric is important because it's what enables you to really begin a real a relationship of confrontation with the state and, for example, process of reappropriation, reappropriation of land, reappropriation of urban spaces, housing, whatever it is. Because we can have these great demands and hopes, but if we don't have the power, it's a question of building the power to then enter into a, rela a different relation, a different power relation with the state. So it's not a question of build yourself from your bootstraps, right? Or, uh, yeah, no. It's a question actually gain more power by strengthening the solidarity of the community because part of the displacement is also the so many community networks and community ties that have been built over decades have been destroyed. And we know it here in the United States. I mean, just the process of gentrification, urban displacement, has destroyed a lot of community as well as industrial restructuring, right? So then now the question of reconstituting a social fabric, it's really fundamental. Yeah, that's what I, but you are absolutely right. The struggle for decriminalization is extremely important. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I can hear me? Sure. Okay, so Yeah. And uh, their economic warfare and isolation. And then the result in ways that they turn the working class against working class. Is that a sufficiently large topic of the world that I should give that book? Uh, specifically it's, for that if 
on researching that. And also, we have other books and other activists that might give you a much better idea of that topic. Uh huh. Well, I think that the enchanting the world is not only dealing with the politics of extractivism. There is a broad literature on the politics of extractivism, right? As you know, what I'm dis discussing in uh, Enchanting the World, it's mostly about the reconstitution in many different places, whether it is Africa, Latin America, of what we call a community built on commoning, particularly on the commoning of reproductive work. So this is one of the things. There's also many other themes that have to do, for example, you know, with uh, the question of uh, technology. You know, the title, The Enchanting the World, it's, uh, it you know, evokes you know, the, the kind of politics that, uh, for example, looks forward to a society that is able to have a different relationship to the natural world. And, uh, and that implies, you know, moving towards the society implies also taking a more critical look than we do take now towards the new technologies, like digital technologies, that uh, many people are celebrating as bringing people together, as creating new forms of action, bringing thousands into the street, etc., etc. And yet, when you look at how they are produced, you see that the production of the digital technology that many people celebrate in the movements as uh, uniting us are actually built on the destruction of many communal lands across the globe. A computer requires an enormous amount of water, requires the filtering of an enormous amount of soil to extract the mineral, right? So the politics of extractivism, the immense expansion of so-called extractivist policies as really functional to the development of digital technology. So I'm arguing <coughs> that in the work, that we really need to be much more aware, much more critical about what is the cost of this technology. Because it's not a matter of being anti-technology and going back to the spade, but it's also not taking in a critical look and a celebratory book, ignoring that so many of the killings, so many of the wars, and so many of the destruction. Not to mention about what this technology do in terms of social relations among people, right? So that's part of it. And uh, <clears throat> I also look at some of the, you know, illusion that we have that, uh, you know, I, I, I think that capitalism has gained probably a hundred years of new life, if not more, with this new technology, because there's an amazing, amazing uh, fascination, right? But uh, we are losing also the sense of what other society have produced, what other society, the kind of powers that in other society, you know, people had developed, you know. And uh, I was mentioning, I mentioned in the book that 4,000 years ago in Babylon, people with their bare eyes were able to see the major constellation of, this, of the sky. They didn't have microscope, right? Or they were able to navigate the ocean even in nights without the moon because they could tell from the waves, the movement of the waves, the direction of, et cetera, et cetera. There was a very, I'm speaking without romanticizing of a world with a different relationship to nature that created possibility, capacities, and that how we are increasingly forgetting all of that. And we are increasingly believing, of course, custom in ourselves, to think that capitalism has produced whatever powers we have. <clears throat> yeah. Maybe we can take two or three questions, maybe a couple of questions. Yes. Yeah, you? Yeah.
I, you know, I, I'm having a difficulty hearing you, maybe. Uh, is there any way that we can ask people to uh, lower a little bit the voice over there? <clears throat> Yes, yes. Were those um, hams, as you called them, they were organized by the women themselves? No, 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 no. No, they were organized by chiefs, by local chiefs, and with some subvention over the years by the government and by NGOs. But they, they are kind of, you know, in fact, these chiefs have built a little commerce on it. Because as the knowledge of these camps has become known, there are now a couple of books in the US there, and several documentaries. One is called The Witches of Gambaga. You know, you may have seen it because it's a documentary that has circulated recently. And uh, so they would ask people, journalists, to go there to pay a certain amount. So they're using the women in the camp to make money, right? By selling access so you can talk to them, right? But they cannot really leave. Uh, they can only leave if people in the community, their families uh, come and take them. But in many cases, it's a dangerous because you might go back to a very uncertain fate. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, wanted to ask you about, um, <clears throat> talk about the, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, the re-commoning of reproductive work, right? And you talk a lot about it in terms of women. Yes. I'm not sure I understand what happens with this reconfiguration. What What do you mean? I'm. I'm if you're saying that <clears throat> the harmony yes. of reproductive activity yes. is primarily among women, uh -huh. how do relations, the role, mm -hmm. change? Oh, well, I mean, I, I certainly, you know, uh, I gave a schematic view. But uh, what I would wanted to drive on is that much of the lead and the initiative right, for the reconstruction of reproduction in a more collective way has come from women. Right? And it's come from women for all kinds of reasons. I mean, because they are much more involved with the reproductive work, because they are much less capable of having access unless they migrate to town or to out of the country to monetary, monetary income. So for example, they are much more dependent on uh, access to fields, access to um, a piece of land because they've had much less access you know, to a monetary uh, source. So this is where the relationship obviously uh, as an impact on the whole community, even though it's the women are obviously more, more capable of organizing these activities, right? And I'm saying often generates tension, for example, with the younger people who are involved. It's not only so clearly gender divided all the time. You know, I visited a community, for example, in uh, near Oaxaca in Mexico, 
you know, some of you probably know that I mean, Oaxaca is a place that many people have gone to, actually near Ocotlan in Oaxaca State. And in that community, which is called San Juan del Progreso, about 15 years ago, a gold mine came. And it's an open-air gold mine. And when you go by, you really see there's a constant cloud. In a beautiful blue sky day, you see a constant cloud, no? And when the mine came, within a short time, the community divided up for the mine against the mine. You know, some people said those for the, for the life and those for death, because they believed that the mine was the death of the community, that it was a matter of time until the local river where everybody took the water would be contaminated and then it would be the end. Then the crops would be contaminated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, that divided the community. So most of the women were against the mine, but not all. So I remember a woman telling me, I don't talk to my daughter any longer. She sides with the mine, I don't talk to her. We don't quarrel, I don't talk anymore. To me, the mine is death, right? And, uh, and so there's been a long struggle. First, they confronted the, the goons, the, the guards and the police, uh, with, with their bodies. People were killed, people were arrested, and then they've developed now a whole micro war. <laughs> you know, they put together whatever little money they have to buy a taxi so that uh, they don't give any money to the people of the, of the mine, right? And the taxi driver is somebody who's against the mine. They don't sell to anybody who's anything to do. They don't buy with anybody who has anything to do with the mine. Don't allow the people who support the mine to go to the local fiesta. They don't allow them to live near. So there is a whole micro war that is not body-body confrontation as they used to do first. But now it's, it's a whole other level of organization. They have created a small local radio that gives the alarm. So that when the people, that something is happening, that they don't like, people come together. That kind, of, that kind of organizing is happening in so many places. It's really happening, and that's what I mean. So for example, the way they organize their daily life, they're really building these strong networks, right? Uh, it's happening in a lot of places, and I would say it's really the women often the lead. Right? Because they're most concerned about well, what kind of food, the water, is, etc., etc. You know? And the children are with them, young people are also with them, but often the women are really the protagonists. And that's why over the last uh, 15, 20 years, there, there's been really a surge of violence against women. Really big, big surge. The women have been really the, the target of a lot of paramilitary, narco-traffickers, uh, and, and also the men of their communities, yeah? who, for example, would support the mine and would say, you know, you're standing in the way of us being able to get some money, being able to have some, some possibility, etc. So there is a big struggle within those communities themselves. Right? And it's a struggle that has to do with the production and with the future and with the relation to capitalist development. And, uh, and there is a, a growing understanding, I think, in a lot of women's network, which are network of women are campesina, indigenous, and often extending to urban, women who are in urban area, that you cannot fight capitalism without fighting patriarchy, without fighting the destruction of the environment, without fighting racism, the, all of this is really one struggle, right? The struggling against imperialism, capitalism, racism, sexism, it's really one struggle. It's only different aspect of the same. And that kind of consciousness, I think, is very powerful because it's now more and more a matter of fact. It's now something more and more that is in the movements. And I think is what giving so much power, for example, of big movements like Ni Una Menos in Argentina, which, which uh, 
focuses on violence against women, but actually brings together women who are fighting against all of these things, who are fighting against expropriation, who are fighting against capitalist development. Well, now, violence against women is like, you know, the, the, the one that is bringing people with more rage and more struggle, but with the knowledge that their violence you know, has very deep age, you know, very deep economic and social roots. And you kind of, it's structural. It's not a matter of men who are perverse. Although they are men who are perverse because they've been so brutalized or because they are interest, they have an interest in destroying resistance, right? Yeah. Other question? Yeah, yes. <clears throat> I want to ask you about the relationship between secularity and capitalism. Between? Um, secularity and capitalism. Secularity, okay. Uh, and there's two prompts to this question. The first sure. Thing, what do you, um, how do you see the possibility of the powers that you were describing earlier as a, as a viable form of resistance against capitalism? And second, what do you make of the fact that witchcraft has been taken up by capitalism and this hmm. impact of a, a possible identity under capitalism that many people are interested in? Mm, right. So is there a form of witchcraft that, that actually is still a, a form of resistance against capitalism that describes um, a possibility of other, other powers? Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, first I want to say something in the notion of secularity. Did you question? Yeah, the question was, uh, it was about the whole issue of uh, witchcraft if there is a, a positive element in connected with the notion of magic or witchcraft that is useful for struggle. And on the other side, what do I think of the fact that capitalism is now picking up the image of the witch and commercializing it, right? And uh, before I go into that, I want to say something about, because uh, she used the concept of secularity, and I wanted to bring in the story of religion for a minute because I think it's crucial here, right? That uh, the big revival of uh, uh, witch hunting, for example, in Africa and other parts of the world, I think is also directly connected to the spread of um, evangelical sects, particularly Pentecostal sects that began to spread in Africa, Latin America in the 1980s. Just at the beginning, they came hand in hand with the World Bank, the IMF, structural adjustment, land privatization. Here come these people, you know, financed from right-wing organization in the United States with the Bible and with the handbook. They begin with sin the sinner, Satan, the devil. I, I, yeah, they have this handbook and uh, they now are so dominant in a number of countries that even on TV, for example, in Ghana, you can watch program on TV that tell you how to recognize a witch, right? So this all coming back of witch hunting is not unplanned is not spontaneous, is not once again coming from below, but is very much coming from above. Yeah, there would not have been, and even the Pope has begun to, you know, talk about Satan, the, as Satan has come back. Anyway, uh, I would like to go back sometime in the discussion also to the question of religion. But um, in terms of uh, magic, right? Uh, I called the enchanting the world that somebody told me that chanting, re-enchanting, enchantment comes from chanting, right? That in many rituals in the past, the chant was a way of producing a particular state of consciousness, right? So re-enchanting in a way has to do with producing a different state of consciousness. Uh, and uh, I, I, I see, when I was speaking before, you know, of uh, 
those night watchers, those people who were looking at the stars, or at the people who were navigating, you know, without the moon, because they could tell the movement of the, from, with their own bodies, they could tell the movement of the waves, right? That's a form of enchantment, right? There is the enchantment of a particular relationship with the natural world that uh, give you the sense that there are powers on this earth, in this universe, that are alive, bigger than us, that you feel connected to a whole other reality that is not your little, small, enclosed body. Capitalism has not only enclosed the lands, has also enclosed our bodies, enclosed our mind, has enclosed our bodies, so that uh, we are disconnected from nature, we are disconnected from animals, we are disconnected from other people, we are disconnected from our own selves. We are disconnected from our own bodies and our own powers, right? So there's been one of the things that I've been trying to bring through the, the book is that, uh, you know, contrary to the common view, the capitalism has increased the production of wealth, a conception that is strong in the Marxist tradition, right? Capitalism has increased the productivity of labor, has produced, right, this, Promethean, titanic image of capitalist development, the great producer of wealth, right? That we don't see the impoverishment. We don't see what is that we also have lost, right? And it's impoverishment that uh, this is one, why do we revolt? How can we walk down the street? I, in any, moment any part of the United States, you cannot walk two blocks without seeing people dying in the street, without people seeing where, where are we now, what has happened to us, that we can allow this to happen, that we can just walk by in front of another human being who is going to terrible, terrible process of destruction and must be terrified. I'll be terrified if I lived in the street. If in a night like this I didn't have anything, I'd be in the street without anything, not knowing. And but this has become an orb. Most, of, most people can actually pass through, and we all pass through. So something has happened to us that uh, we have been able to accept and become numbed to a tremendous amount of suffering around us, right? And I'm, I'm not saying this in a moralistic way to say, oh, how bad we are, I pass by too. But I'm saying that there's been a tremendous impoverishment and, uh, and there's been, uh, you know, that has to do with the way also, you know, with the enclosure of land, with the industrialization, with the privatization of urban spaces, the destruction of communities that have been built over, you know, more and more people are, you know, really uh, made to feel that they are completely reliant on this uh, limited reality, the reality of our bodies, our individual life. So this, I think, is the enchantment, the recreation of the commons, and commons not only with other people, but also with the natural world, with the animal world, is the enchantment of the world. Is the reconnecting with the different conception of what reality is, right? Call it spirituality, call it a different sense of the powers of nature, but certainly a different kind of reality. In terms of the capitalist use, I'm very disgusted. It's not new, right? I, you go across Europe, for example, in areas where women have been executed, and you see a very obscene trade of dolls that, you know, represent the witch, represent a totally caricature picture of the woman that was murdered, that was burnt alive, and it's the witch with the big hair, the teeth out, 
the eyes, the very satanic eye, the mad smile, and 20 euros, and your child can walk away, or you can buy a coffee cup with the witch on the coffee, or you can buy a dish towel, etc., etc. So next March, we are going to do a protest in some of these places in the north of Spain and across the border in, in France which is where they have all these shops at the border, you know, lined up with witches, lined up. Incredibly obscene. Imagine, I always say, imagine going to Auschwitz and then next to Auschwitz, we are going to see a, an emporium, you know, a shop that is selling little dolls with the representation of the Auschwitz inmates. Right? So, how degraded in the public conception women are that they can actually represent, you know, it's, but I always make the parallel with the indigenous people, that the whole amusement industry was built, you know, on the massacre of the native people of this continent. But something is happening. So, the, the commercialization of the witch hands is not new. Now there is a new thing. I think it's because with the new women's movement, right, there's been a reappropriation of the image of the witch, right? There's been a reappropriation because uh, what the state condemns, right, the movement has appropriated in uh, so many places. At the end of a demonstration, you hear women chanting, you know, we are the granddaughters of all the witches that you have not been able to burn, right? In Latin America, somos las nietas de todas las brujas que no pudiste quemar, no? It's, there's been a reappropriation in a context of struggle. And so immediately, you know, there is a commercialization, there is a use, which I think is totally obscene and, you know, should be criticized and rejected. Yeah. Sylvia, I think we only have time for one more question. Okay, one more question. All right. Where is it? Ah, okay. Sorry, I did a Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot there's a whole part here. So, Thank you so much, Sylvia. Your uh, writing and your organizing has been a huge inspiration to me for a uh, long time. Um, I just wanted to bring up a little bit, um, I collect the names of all the, the sex workers who've been murdered throughout uh -huh. the year, yes. and we've seen a lot of, this year, a huge uptick in men who are practicing witchcraft, who are ritualized murdering sex uh, workers for huh. the practice of witchcraft, allegedly. Um, and I think that the point that you made about like the patriarchal terrorism of like these public murders of trans people and women is really important. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about like how capitalism obscures itself into how it enacts engendered violence, mm. um, I would appreciate that. How capitalism obscures itself? That capitalism is what's making people poor, but instead they're going to kill sex workers so they can make more money because sex workers are a symbol of wealth in these rituals. Um, actually. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Okay. Uh, I can say something that I know. I lived in Nigeria, and uh, in the 80s, um, there was all these stories that were coming out in the press that were saying that people were being kidnapped and cut up for uh, rituals because certain organs and so on will give you power, so that they disappear. Then, slowly, uh, many people said, uh-uh, it's not necessarily all-time rituals. It's really what is happening is the big spreading, you know, uh, industry, the organ trafficking, that is now being hidden, is now being masqueraded as kind of all, all kind of African ritual. But actually, it's a very modern, capitalist-based organ trafficking that was in fact spreading in a lot of places, and also in the American 
Right. So I'm not sure because I haven't heard or I haven't heard what you're just talking about. I didn't know that now there were sex workers who were being killed for their organs. Is that what is happening now? Yes. Right. Here? Uh, I've also heard about it in Zimbabwe and Oh, okay. In Ghana, and it oh. Is an all right. So yeah, in Africa, this is what has been taking place. It's not just it's not just sex workers. A lot of children. So it's been children, and uh, as I said, it was it began in the eighties, and at first it was uh, the question of the ritual, but I think there's another probably much more realistic view, which is it's not the ritual. It's really part of an organ trafficking. I mean, I know, for example, uh, in Italy, I come originally from Italy, so I always follow what is happening there with more. And uh, in many, many cases, lots of children have been disappearing. And people have been connecting it with the organ trafficking. Like, uh, unfortunately, there's had a lot of uh, cases of natural disaster, many earthquakes. So in the earthquakes, you have this big, you know, people have been put together and so on. And uh, you know, people sleep outside in tent. Children always, always, when you have this situation, children have been disappearing and it's been connected. So I suspect that this is what is happening. Yeah. Okay, this is the last question. Thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you. And buy the books. <laughs> yes, I think you will like them. Okay.